Pastor Price for Teen Sunday School. The juniors will be dismissed with Mrs. Price for Junior Sunday School. The adults will remain here for Adult Sunday School. And, um... Let's see. We've got the notes here. Can I get a volunteer to pass the notes out? And, um... Could you also... Do you know how to fix the feedback on that thing? We got a lot. Is there a lot of feedback? Yeah, you can hear it. It kind of got an echoey echo back. Good morning, juniors. Mrs. Price is uh, ready and waiting for you next door. Good to see you guys. That'll work good. Right on through, right on through. Is that a Chris? Uh, yeah, a little better indeed. Thank you. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. Um, yesterday, if you weren't there, there was a battle waged at my house, and um, I was predominantly an innocent bystander in this battle. Um, well, perpetrator is what Brother Dan says, and that's actually closer to the truth. I actually was the perpetrator of this battle. Uh, the instigator, the uh, evil mastermind, if you will. The teens had a food fight. And uh, we had a great time. We had oatmeal. We had uh, uh, chocolate syrup. We had flour, which is also known as wheat dust. We had, um, what else? We had ketchup. We had mustard. And pretty much all of it ended up on me. So it was a good time. Um, and most of it's still on my house. So that's a project for later today. Anyway, does everybody have the notes? Okay, good. All right. We'll begin here uh, in our Sunday school lesson today. We are in week number seven of our series for strengthen those things that remain. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Earl. How you guys doing? And uh, this week we are looking at growing from your Bible. We're looking at Bible studying this week, and um, what we're trying to do in this series is help people to be strong Christians at the foundation. A building which is strong on top but lacks a strong foundation is not a strong building. So it's very important for us as Christians, here you go, Brother O, to be strong in our foundation. Uh, last week, what was our lesson about? Prayer. Prayer, and specifically what? How and why to pray, yes, thank you. Our uh, lesson last week was specifically concerning answered prayer, and we looked at how to pray, what the Bible says about it, and uh, what the Bible has to say about answered prayer and unanswered prayer. This week we're looking in detailing, uh, detail about studying the Bible. Our series to come in just about three short weeks is Words in Context, and we'll be looking at different words in the Bible, and what those words mean inside their context and how the Bible uses those words. For instance, the term baptism has several different contexts. There is water baptism in the Bible. There is also baptism in the Spirit. So when a passage talks about baptism, it's important to look carefully at what it's talking about. And there's a lot of other terms we'll be looking at, and um, I believe it'll help people a lot to be able to understand specifically what the Bible is talking about so it's a really great series. I'm looking forward to it. Also, further, we are planning on, um, here in the future, we're looking at dividing the adult Sunday school class because it's beginning to be large enough that we're going to be dividing it. So that's coming up in the future. So it's uh, something to look forward to and be excited about. So um, our church is growing, and it's growing by leaps and bounds, and it's great. We saw two or maybe three people saved in door-to-door -door visitation last week. I don't remember which exactly. We um, have a lot of people who are interested in coming to the church. We just need to follow up on them now. So a lot's going on. So um, now that everyone has uh, been for thoroughly bored by my announcements. Oh, okay, good. You got a stash. A stash. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I'm also out of announcements, so we'll go ahead and begin our lesson today. Study the Bible. The command to study the Bible, capital letter A, 
And uh, we find this command in 2 Timothy 2.15. Can someone volunteer and read that for me? Exactly. Study to show thyself a workman approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, as I'm trying to turn and trying to quote it at the same time, neither is working. Um, here we go. Study to show thyself approved unto God. So we're going to be looking at what it talks about. Should a person study the Bible? And the answer is definitively yes. Why? Well, because God says so. And because God said so is an all-end-all answer and should be for us believers. But God does give us reasons why to study the Bible. Now, when we were little kids, perhaps our parents, we'd ask why, and they would perhaps say, because I said so. And that'll work when your child is young, but once they get to be a teenager, it really won't work and it'll just make them angry. But uh, because I said so, sometimes is the only answer which can be given because a child simply doesn't understand. Why shouldn't I put a key into an electrical socket? Well, because you'll get zapped. Well, why shouldn't I get zapped? Because you could get killed. Well, why? Well, because the electrons are going to complete the circuit and flow through your body and perhaps interrupt your heart rhythm, resulting in a lethal rhythm and killing you. Well, why? Because I said so, don't do it. <laughs> Well, the Bible does give us reasons here why to study the Word of God. And um, it says here, the reason why is to be a workman who is approved unto God. And uh, this idea behind approved here is acceptable for use. And it kind of, the idea behind it would often be associated with uh, coin making and rubbing the rough edges off a coin after you'd... Uh, after you'd put it in the mold and get it out, you'd have maybe some rough edges on it. Molds weren't always great back then. So you'd maybe have to smooth it out and get it ready for use. And so that's the idea behind approved here. Interestingly, it is the exact opposite of the idea behind um, uh, the uh, term castaway, lest when I preached unto others, I myself should become a castaway. It's the uh, exact opposite word, uh, dokamos versus adokamos, for those interested. It's the exact opposite word. So we need to be approved unto God so we don't become castaways, so we don't become useless for service. And um, the uh, idea behind this is that a believer learns to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, when a person is busy building a building, the old saying is measure twice, cut once. It's a lot of fun to measure once, cut twice, measure once, slap an extra two by four, slap a third two by four on, screw the thing together. But that's not the right way to do it. I've done it, but it doesn't work right. It's better to rightly divide your boards so you don't end up with a tremendous mess. And my dad had me build this one shed when I was younger. We lived in uh, the hills in Pennsylvania. And uh, he asked me to build this shed for a goat. And I built this shed for the goat using the boards around the yard. He called it the abomination of desolation. It was a pretty scrappy looking shed, but it did hold the goat in. Well, anyway, the, um, it wasn't very rightly divided. But rightly dividing the word of truth produces a believer who is useful to God, who's ready to be used by God. And uh, rightly dividing the word of truth is critical for understanding true doctrine and avoiding false doctrine. Where does a lot of false doctrine come from? Well, poorly dividing the word of truth. Someone grabs the Bible and they snatch perhaps a section out of it and they build some kind of doctrine around the little piece which they've snatched and instead of arriving at the truth God wants them to have, they arrive at doctrinal disaster and they end up destroying themselves because they miss the truth God had for them and they fall into false doctrine. great example of poorly dividing the word of truth is taking the uh, passage uh, Mark 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not and uh, shall be damned. 
as taking that passage and saying that you have to be baptized in order to be saved from your sins when that's not what that passage is talking about. Um, so that's a great example of poorly dividing the word of truth. So it's important for us to rightly divide the word of truth. So we see also, we'll also look at the importance of the word of God. We looked at this several weeks ago, but we'll look at another verse briefly. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Can someone read that for me, please? Go ahead, Brother Kyle. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So the Bible is more important than physical food. Yes, we need physical food to eat. No, we shouldn't stop eating because the Bible is more important than food. And no, we shouldn't eat Bibles. Um, a few of you are still awake and laughed. Um, the important point Jesus is trying to get across there for us is that the Bible should be what is central to our lives. We eat so we can read the Bible, if you will. Um, not we eat for the filling of our own satisfaction, not that we can just sustain ourselves and live, but we live to serve God, and reading the Bible is critical to our lives. So, the Bible it should be what is critical to us. It should be our source of sustenance. It should be that which we seek for above all else. And uh, our spiritual food, the bread of life, John 6, 35, I'll read it because I'm already there. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus also describes himself as the word of God in uh, John chapter 1. When we partake of the Bible, we are partaking of Christ. When you read the Bible and you look into it, this is how God speaks to you. This is how God sustains your spirit. This is how God teaches you, how he grows you, how he fills you, how he satisfies you. So you need to read the Bible and you need to study the Bible. You need to figure out what it's saying to you. And the more you read and study the Bible, the stronger you will become in Christ. The better equipped you will be to serve him. And... Uh, Go ahead and just jot this on your notes. This is extra. Develop a hunger and thirst for the Bible. Just go ahead and jot that down in your notes somewhere. Develop a hunger and thirst for the Bible. We do what we like to do. It's true. And uh, we typically eat what we like to eat. I like to eat peanuts a lot. And so typically I try to get peanuts every so often because I like them. For whatever reason, Pastor Price really doesn't like peanuts. And he gets annoyed when I get peanuts and eat them on car trips. I like Pastor Price a lot, but selfishly I also like peanuts a lot. So I seek after these peanuts, sometimes to his irritation and detriment. Well, he mostly just kids about it. He doesn't like the smell of them. He says it fills the car with the smell of peanuts which I guess could get old after a while, but on the men's trip, we also had seaweed in the car, too. That, it was an excellent trip. Um, so I like peanuts. I've developed a hunger for peanuts, and it makes me want to get peanuts. It makes me go for peanuts. I desire to eat peanuts. I like them. And that's just kind of a silly illustration, but we, as believers, need to desire the Word of God. We need to go after it. We need to go after it above other things. We need to seek it and to develop a hunger and thirst for it more than anything else. So that's what we're going after. We go after what we like. When you go to the store, you buy the foods you like, and that's what you eat. You don't buy foods you don't like. Very few of us would go to the store and uh, perhaps buy something peculiar and eat it simply because we don't like it. So um, develop a hunger and thirst for the Word of God. And how can you do that? One, pray for God to give you that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And uh, two, you will develop a taste for it the more you grow into it. You won't like the Bible if you don't read the Bible. It's as simple as that. Um, people say that a lot of things are an acquired taste. When there's some truth to that, the 
The more you grow in the Bible, the more you will like growing in the Bible. And if you're not right now reading your Bible and growing in it, you won't want to. You won't have that spiritual discernment to know you need the Bible. So you need to start reading it and growing in it whether you feel like it or not. And your flesh will fight against that. But you can't let the flesh win. You can't let the devil win. You must read your Bible and grow in it. Roman numeral two, how to study the Bible. I have here two Bible study methods laid out. And um, there are more Bible study methods than just these two methods here. But I put these here because they are rather representative of methods of how to study the Bible. And uh, they're probably the two most used Bible study methods. This is in addition to just reading the Bible for personal growth. This is uh, actual studying in depth the Bible. Now, studying the Bible is good, but you cannot simply study the whole Bible in one moment. It's too big. Um, there was a guy I read about, he ate an airplane. He was one of those strange people who eats metal. I don't remember how big the airplane was. It wasn't a huge airplane, but it was still an airplane. It was, but he ate a whole airplane. The, they asked him how he ate the airplane, and he answered simple. It was piece by piece he ate it. You know, a few bolts here, and over time he ate it. He was one of those strange people who appear in the Guinness World Book of Records. But if a person can eat an airplane, but they do it piece by piece. You study the Bible and you learn to see what it has for you piece by piece. Now, the first method here is the book study. And studying a book of the Bible is a great thing. And uh, so it helps you see what a particular book has to say, what its message is. And so supposing we are going to do a book study. Our very first step, and you should do everything step by step when you're doing something like a study, if you don't do things step by step in an orderly fashion, your study won't be particularly effective. It'll be scattered. It'll be uh, without focus. It won't really work very well. So have a method. And here we have a method laid out. Step number one, select the book to be studied. For your first study, choose a short and simple book. Do not, for your first study, choose the book of Jeremiah, which is the longest book in the Bible. You probably won't succeed and you'll probably get discouraged. So you, for your first book study, don't do something which is above and beyond your skill level or you'll just get discouraged in it. And uh, the point isn't to get discouraged, so use a little bit of uh, discretion on that. Choose a shorter book. Okay, here I have uh, three books listed out here, Titus, Ruth, Galatians. Those are all three pretty short books. And uh, choose a simple book. The book of 1 Peter is a great book, but it's got several hotly debated passages in it. I would advise against using the book of 1 Peter as your first book to study because getting through those passages would require a lot of work and could bog you down and torpedo your study. You don't want that on your first study. Choose a simple book. And uh, choose a book which is both interesting and applicable to you. So, a, uh, perhaps something the Holy Spirit's been showing you a lot lately. And uh, perhaps something he's been opening your eyes to. Choose a book which is along those lines. Say, uh, for example, the book of Philippians talks about joy and suffering. It also delves into the themes of Christ's sacrificial death for us and our resultant responsibility. Um, the book of 1 Thessalonians talks a lot about the second coming of the Lord and our need to be ready for it and to be watching for it. So choose a book which has something in it which the Holy Spirit's been opening your eyes to, which um, God has been bringing to your heart, something which is interesting to you. Um, step two, so you have your book selected. We'll assume for the sake of this study that we have selected the book of Philippians. It's a four-chapter book, simple book. It's got perhaps a hundred verses in it, if even that. Two, master the general contents of the book. How do we do this? Read it through multiple times in one setting. Um, so you sit, 
You read the book through several times in a row. This could take perhaps half an hour or to an hour even. So carefully budget the right amount of time for this step. It's important to get this step in one setting so that way your mind is able to, in one setting, fully grasp it. If you cannot, then break it up into several, perhaps half an hour segments, several days in a row. Not everybody is going to have a full hour or two they can fully dedicate without any reserve or interruption, but try to spl split it up if you must. But this step is important to read it several times in one setting, or even read it every day, several days in a row. But uh, 10 times if possible, and then what your goal is is to comprehend the message and purpose of the book. If you read a book through several times straight, you'll know, you'll have a general idea of what's going on in the book. You, you'll be able to see and you'll be able to express what the book is about. And so then, write a summary of the book. This is what's great about computers. You don't have to have a sore wrist from writing. You can type it out and... Um, Typing isn't cheating at all. So basically, this is really for your benefit. When you get it from your head onto paper, what happens is it gives you a much better way of comprehending. If you can't really express something, you haven't reached comprehension of it. So you need to be able to put it down on paper, summarize the book, to whom it's written, what its major teachings are, ask yourself some questions, and these are, you know, the standard journalism questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, you know, about the book. Again, this whole study thing here, you don't do all these steps in one setting. Don't make yourself overwhelmed. When you're writing a summary of the book, dedicate 15 minutes here, half an hour there. Just spend some time studying it and uh, trying to answer these questions. And uh, try to condense this into a four to five sentence paragraph if you can. Start out with more and then try to condense and summarize it as best you can and uh, to really communicate it. So you'll want to have a longer summary and then you'll try to compress that summary into a fairly short statement. If you can compress a longer summary into a short statement, it'll help you to really see what are the key elements of that book and what needs to be expressed. And by the way, this is something, this kind of study, this is something anybody can do. It really is. This isn't hard. Don't let yourself be overwhelmed in your mind because this is really simple. It takes, only, the only skill it takes is the ability to read and the ability to write. That's the only physical skill it takes. That You don't have to have ever even gone to college. You don't even have to have graduated from high school. You don't even ever have to have gone to school to be able to do this kind of study. You just have to read. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to um, uh, have any major skills. You just have to be able to read and write. And uh, those are simple things for each of us. So, um, then begin by dividing the book into an outline. So, you will have read this book through. You will have summarized it. And by this point some major points should be able to begin to crystallize. So what you do is first you go through the book and you find each little dividing. So we jump ourselves to the book of Philippians. And our first dividing would be uh, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So our first divider would be verses 1 through 2. Our next divider would be verses 3 through 7. And you can kind of follow the periods to find your little dividers. Just basically uh, put things in little divisions by flow of thought. Don't outline it yet. Just get the whole book broken up. And again, this is something which is really easy to split into multiple block segments here. You just have to go through and outline things out or uh, break things out. Then once you have the whole book broken down into these little verse segments, then find the overall thoughts and then outline the verses under the thoughts. And of course, this lesson here is a great example of what an outline can look like. Roman numeral one, big thought. Big thought here, 
Paul's introduction. <coughs> next big thought in this book. Um, verse 12 begins the next major thought. Next major thought begins chapter 2, verse 1. Often, you can kind of cheat if you're struggling to find where you should break things up and follow the chapter designations. This is not in all cases. Do not rely exclusively on the chapters because the chapters are not always divided up along the major thought lines. Often they are. Um, then, you know, you have little sub-thoughts. Uh, under verse 12, under that main thought, you would have the first sub-thought beginning in verse 12. You would have the next sub-thought beginning in um, verse 15, another sub-thought beginning in verse 18. And so you kind of divide things into the capital letters. And then as you have them kind of div divided down, you divide those sub-thoughts into further sub-thoughts. And your first book study don't go too far in detail yet. Try not to overwhelm yourself. Um, unless you find it's going particularly well, then go, go at it as best you wish. But be careful not to overwhelm yourself, understand. Don't get in over your head. Then once you've got it outlined, you will have learned a tremendous amount. God will have been able to show you a whole lot of things. Then study each verse in order. And as you study each verse, understand the exact meaning of each verse. To understand the exact meaning of a verse, you need to understand the exact meaning of each word in each verse. Let the Bible be its own best dictionary. There are terms in the Bible which sometimes may seem unclear in one verse, but are clearer in different verses. Um, some terms only occur occasionally in the Bible, um, or very infrequently, but the great thing is, there is a dictionary to help you look up words and figure out what their meaning is. And uh, moreover, there's a great book called Strong's Concordance, Amen. which will help you find out where every word is listed in your Bible. Um, I believe you can access Strong's Concordance on the internet for free. I'm not sure about that if you don't have one. Yes? Um, you'll, if so, <clears throat> you might find a word, like in Job, the word darkness in one verse is four times. But if you check each word out, they're all different meanings. Yeah. So you've got to, just don't take it as this is what it's all going to mean in one sentence or one verse, sometimes there's different meanings and it's translated in our one word. Yeah, um, and that actually is uh, going towards more an exegetical study, actually, which is not really quite comprehended in this study. So um, an exegetical study would be a study where you're looking at the original words and their original languages, translating those words, doing a word study on those words, um, doing a study in the uh, other uses not in the Bible of those words, and then coming up with the conclusion. An exegetical study is beyond most people's training. It's beyond my training. Um, I haven't studied Greek in that detail yet. Um, but that is a good study method, but uh, you have to be careful when using Strong's Concordance as your point of exegesis, if you will. If you look at Strong's definition for Greek words and then look at the Greek words in the Bible you can mess yourself up a little bit not understanding Greek grammar. So be careful about basing too much of your understanding on your translation of Greek if you don't know Greek, if you take my meaning for it. So, um, but yes, um, Strong's Concordance is extremely helpful. And uh, if you don't have one, I think they're on the internet. I do have one. Um, I usually use a Bible program for it. But uh, they are available, and uh, there's a free one called eSword, which also searches the Bible and helps you find terms. And um, so they're very helpful study methods, and it'll help you find where these words are and help you to find them. So um, once you've understood the meaning of the words in the verse, understand carefully the context. You can take a verse and twist it to mean all kinds of things if you're not careful. So know what's going on in the verses around it. For instance, any part of this lesson could be grabbed 
and used to say all kinds of things. So, um, this is a very common thing in the political world, is you'll see some candidates attacking some other candidate. And they'll say, he said this, 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 and this. And they'll say, wow, he said some bad things. And then you'll look and see, if you look and see what he was actually saying, it wasn't what he was saying at all. So be careful not to twist the Bible. And then examine parallel passages. All right, parallel passages. Um, parallel passage for Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Great parallel passage would be the parallel passage where Jesus tells the disciples to serve each other as he served them. John chapter 13. So what would be a great parallel passage for Philippians chapter 2, verse 11? What would be a good parallel passage? Good answer. Correct. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 and 20 talk about when Jesus finally defeats the evil and reigns. So that's a good answer for that. So um, be careful in your analysis of each verse. Again, don't get yourself too bogged down. There is an almost infinity of parallel passages for any verse on any particular topic. Um, for instance, in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, if you looked up every word which, verse which had beloved in it and studied every verse which had beloved, your study would sink. You would never finish it. So you can't do that. So don't go overboard, but be careful not to quite go underboard. Um, analyze the verse. When you're looking at a verse, don't find what's not in the verse. When you hear hoofbeats going down the street, if you were in the United States, assume horses before assuming zebras. Is it possible for zebras to run down Federal Highway? Yes. Is it likely? No. Not really. It's not even too likely for horses. Uh, I think it happens sometimes. I think it sounds like they have uh, maybe sometimes like... Uh, police I th they, parade or something. Yeah, parade. And police. They have horse police here too. I see them sometimes. I don't think I've... Maybe I have. I don't know. If you go downtown, you see them, though. Uh, you'll see them around. And um, be careful, though, to find what is in the verse. But again, don't go too far, too deep. For instance, the verse, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, don't spend too long trying to analyze the depths of doctrines of that verse. But the next verse, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, in this verse, grace and peace, a divine blessing coming from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, is linking God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ both as God. So it's interesting when you analyze verses to see other applications than just the direct application, which is that this is a greeting being given from Paul to the church, but it does apply to us and it does teach a lot. So, then state what is found as accurately and as possible um, from each verse you study. And then finally, when you're done with that, write a final summary of what the book teaches. So just uh, kind of, you know, write out a final summary of what the book is teaching following your outline. This study method can take a while, but you will glean a whole lot from it. This study method can take a very long time, especially if you've never really done anything like it before. So start simple, work small, and uh, build your way up. Your first book study, try not to make it take more than a few weeks or you'll get bogged and you'll never finish. So try not to make it too hard. Don't get too in-depth in trying to analyze each verse and each word, but just understand what it is saying. Try to make it finishable. If you don't make it finishable, you'll sink and you'll get frustrated, and you don't want to do that. Make it doable. And uh, as you build up your ability to study the Word of God and understand it, you'll find that God will give you great wisdom in His Word, and He'll really teach you. You'll be able to 
understand the Word of God in ways you've never understand it, stood it before, and you'll be able to teach others the Word of God in ways you've never been able to teach them before, and it will help you and it will change you. And it will um, help you to see the goodness of God, and it will help you to see how much He loves you more than you've ever seen it before. Well, we also have the topical study. The book study is great. The book study is great because it helps you to see an entire book, an entire segment of Bible, and helps you to comprehend it. A topical study is a little bit different. You grab a topic of some kind and you study it. Now, the danger of a topical study, which does not exist with a book study, is if you study a topic, what can happen is you one, have the danger of becoming a little bit one-sided. There's people who grab one topic and that's the only thing they know. They don't understand the rest of the Bible, what it teaches about anything. They don't understand the whole scope of the Word of God. They become one-sided. And sometimes they get into quite wild doctrines because they don't understand what the Bible's really talking about. So you need to be careful not to go overboard in topical study. And another thing which can happen, another danger with topical studies is you didn't really, when doing your study, you didn't do your work carefully enough and so you didn't uh, comprehend everything of what you should have comprehended in that topical study. And so you miss critical passage which talk about it and you end up arriving at the wrong conclusions on the topic. Well, concerning a topical study, so what's a good topic? Well, pick one here in a second. Be systematic about your topical studies. So list important topics from the Bible or from a book in the Bible. You can do a topic by book study. And uh, Philippians would be a great one here to do a topic by book. There's a number of interesting topics in this book, a number of themes. Probably the best book in the whole Bible to do a topical thematical study on would be 1 John. The book of 1 John is a very hard book to outline, but it has the underlying themes of light and darkness. It has the theme of the love of God. Its overall theme, its overarching theme, is fellowship with God. So it is a great book for a theme study. Um, so select the topics one by one in logical order. Don't get too involved here or you'll sink yourself, but list a number of topics to study and uh, then start studying them in order. And when you select a topic to study, be specific enough to be completable, but broad enough to be applicable. What's this mean? Well, make sure that your topic, like if you wanted to study holiness in the Bible, your topical study would not end soon. You could study holiness in the Bible and evaluate the Hebrew word for holiness versus the Greek word for holiness and look at holiness, human holiness, uh, divine holiness. You could look at all these things and you wouldn't get done soon, but you'd have a great book to write at the end of it. I advise against that. Let's pick a very specific topic and uh, say a very specific topic could be the holiness of God in his judgment of sinners. That is a specific topic. It is a topic you can work with, but it's not a topic so narrow that you perhaps won't get very far. Like say you could say the holiness of God and his judgment of the sinners at uh, Jericho. Very specific topic. Perhaps a little too specific. A little bit broader. The holiness of God and his judgment of the people in Canaan land and uh, why he gave Canaan to the Israelites and dispossessed the Canaanites. Good topic. Specific enough to be doable, yet broad enough to be applicable. Um, so a topic here, the love of God. We'll say we're studying this in a book. Yes? Also uh, a study of the first mention of the subjects in the Bible. Of course, you'd be in Genesis mostly, but to, to trace first mention principle through the scriptures, you'd have a great study. Yeah, you could do a uh, study on first mention. That would actually be a different study topic from a topical study somewhat. Um, or in your topical study, part of being thorough with it would be to go to the first mention of that topic. 
For instance, if we were to study the gospel, if we were to study uh, the giving of the gospel, our very first reference would be Genesis chapter 3, 15. Uh, verse 15. Thank you. Um, if we were, say, to study the topic of um, sacrifice, that topic would have been be addressed shortly thereafter and uh, when God's giving of the skins for Adam and Eve. Um, so you do need to go, yes, to the very first reference when you're studying a topic or what will happen? You'll arrive at the wrong conclusions for your topic because you'll have missed an important passage. The law of first reference is important in Bible study, so uh, do be careful when you study them. And, uh, of course, as we were saying there, be thorough. List each passage in which the Bible teaches the topic. This is why you need to have a specific enough topic. If you went and listed each passage in which the Bible references holiness, you'll never finish your study. But if you study by book, if you do a book topical study and list each time the book of 1 John references the love of God, you'll be able to complete it. So I would actually in many ways advise a book topical study before you do a broad topical study, just so you don't make it too hard on yourself, especially in the first round. Again, the very first time you do a Bible study in depth for something, the devil will attack you hard and his main attack will be to get you to quit and his main method of quitting will be one, to make you too busy to be in the Word of God and two, will make you frustrated with studying the Word of God. So be careful not to make it too hard on yourself. Use discretion. Um, let the Bible be its own interpreter of meaning. Um... Don't assign meaning to stuff which the Bible doesn't ascribe. Like I was reading in this one guy's things, he was talking about how Joab wore a belt and how that belt always talks about judgment. And Joab symbolized judgment and David symbolized the mercy of God. And he was going just ridiculous conclusions based on stuff. And uh, don't come up with ridiculous conclusions. Um... If what you're saying is starting to sound peculiar, step back and think about it for a second. Because it is possible in your study of the Bible to read into things a little too much. We're all weak flesh. We're all sinners. None of us are perfect in our understanding. So carefully step back and uh, make sure you don't come up with strange conclusions, uh, with winds of doctrine, with uh, every... Uh, as it talks about in the Bible, with every wind of doctrine, make sure you don't come up with strange teachings. Um, evaluate what is being taught in it for each verse, being aware of context. Be exact. Do not skip passages which deal with the topic. And uh, make use of a concordance to help with the studies. A concordance is critical to a topical study, especially a, uh, a whole Bible topical study. It'll help you tremendously. And um, at the end, write an analysis and a summary of what is taught on the topic. Make an outline of the general verses which teach on the topic and uh, just uh, summarize what is taught and come up with a final evaluation and summary of that. We are out of time. Briefly, personal conditions for Bible study. First, you must be born again. An unsafe person cannot understand the Bible. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Um, the Bible says neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Yes. Uh, what was the reference for that first one you were just saying? Which one? Uh, that you need to be uh, born again to understand the Bible. Uh, the reference there is, that reference would be 1 Corinthians, um, what's that, Charlie? Uh... No, that would be chapter 2, verse 14. Very close. Two verses from chapter 3. Thank you. So you need to be born again to be able to study the Bible. The next thing is you need to love the Bible. If you don't love the Bible, studying it, you're, you probably would never start a study in any way, but develop a love for the Bible. Next, surrender wholly to God and what he will reveal. God will not reveal himself to an unsurrendered heart. won't happen. If you say, I want to know the Word of God, I want God to speak to me, but aren't willing for God to speak to you, if, then God is highly unlikely to show you what He wants you to find in the Bible.
Be willing to work and to work hard. It is hard work to study the Bible, but it is profitable. But don't overwhelm yourself. On the one hand, yes, be willing to work, but two, be discreet about how you do it so you don't swamp yourself. If a great idea, I don't have it written down here, but a great idea is to have a study partner or helper. If you are married, your best possible study helper or partner is your spouse. If you're not married like me, well, there's always Charlie Salcedo. Um, have a childlike mind of faith. Again, God doesn't speak to people who uh, are too smart to speak to. Um, God speaks to people who have a heart ready to listen, not to speak to him. God doesn't need us to teach him. Uh, view and study the Bible as the word of God. Don't treat it like Shakespeare, Milton, or something else. Pray and seek the Holy Spirit's leading into truth. And finally, it says seek the wisdom. I forgot to complete the thought there. Apparently, uh, seek God's wisdom. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and to teach you. He'll guide you into all truth if you let him. That's uh, what Jesus talks about. The Holy Spirit came to guide us into all truth. So he will teach you if you'll let him. Um, the purpose of studying Bible is not to be smart, but is to know God. So don't try to study the Bible so you can be smarter than anybody. Studying the Bible will make you smarter. It'll sharpen your brain. That's not why we study the Bible. We study the Bible to know God. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us too. To know you better, not to just know about you, but to know you and to love your word and to make it uh, uh, more important to us than anything. Be with us, please, and work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed. Uh, sermon will, uh, the Sunday morning service will begin shortly.
that way the whole time. Yeah. And I was bringing her the other way. And I was like, no, you're wrong. Right? Now, what's your name? Sophia. My name is Sophia. Sophia. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, she was wrong. Um, I brought her back to the first. Thank you. 